There's a cancer in the education system. Students with this cancer are two and a half times more likely to fail a grade. They're less able to focus, less able to memorize, and in a fundamental affront to the purpose of education, this cancer inhibits a student's ability to create new brain cells. It's not an uncommon cancer. The majority of American students experience it to some degree by the time they're teenagers. And yet, our education system doesn't set aside the resources to deal with this. Now, before I name this cancer, I want to tell you why I'm talking to you about it. Before I came to the GSB, I lived and worked in downtown Detroit, where I helped start a coding boot camp company. I'm proud to say that we trained hundreds of adults in a new career path, software development. But what bothered me at the time was that we were turning away hundreds more. And as I looked at their applications, I realized we weren't turning them away because they had bad attitudes. And it wasn't because they lacked the right motivation. Instead, they had been so deeply underserved by their K-12 education that they were incapable of learning what we had to teach. So I looked into the best analysis and research to understand what is so wrong with K-12. And what I found was that the culprit isn't teacher tenure. And it isn't because there aren't enough iPads in the classroom. Instead, it's this cancer. It's called childhood trauma. And there are many different types. From having a parent in prison to witnessing domestic violence in the home, to experiencing emotional neglect, to sexual abuse. But the common thread, the real definition of childhood trauma is this. It's the experience for a child repeated over years of their safest relationships undermined. The people and environments that should represent safety and security instead become dangerous and threatening. Now, the impact of this trauma is real. People who experience it are more likely to have heart disease, more likely to be depressed, more likely to commit suicide. But one of the most pervasive and yet least discussed impacts of this is its imp impact on learning. And to help us understand exactly what that might look like, let's think of a case study, a student named Sean. Let's say Sean's dad is in prison. And as a result, his mom works long hours to make up for that financial burden. When she comes home from work, she's exhausted and emotionally unavailable for Sean. Let's say Sean wakes up some mornings to an empty house. His mom's already gone to work, and he's left wondering if anyone is looking out for him. Now, as Sean experiences these things, his body responds in the same way that all of our bodies respond to stressful events. His breath gets short, his heart beats faster, and his brain, as it floods with adrenaline and cortisol, experiences a fight or flight response. It's concerned with only one thing, getting Sean out of the situation. It can't think any deeper than that. And that's where Sean's learning gets affected. Because every morning when Sean goes to school, it looks like he's leaving the cause of his trauma at home. But the effects stay with him. He may look like he's ready to learn algebra or grapple with the big questions of history. But his mind has become accustomed to responding to trauma. And that doesn't stop in the classroom. His brain is physiologically incapable of learning and his brain chemistry becomes the barrier to a quality education. Now, a fight response in the classroom might look like Sean acts out and is disruptive. A flight response might look like he's uninterested or disengaged. And if Sean's at a school that hasn't trained its teachers to recognize these things as potential symptoms of childhood trauma, Sean might just be ignored as a problem child. And if he never gets to a school that is prepared to understand what he's struggling with, he might get robbed of an education that he deserves. His very future becomes a victim of his trauma. Now, I know we're talking about the education system here. You know, Child Protective Services is supposed to stop this trauma from happening. But what I think is so critical to understand, and the reason why I'm standing here talking to you today, is that I think that schools have a critical role to play in helping students get the tools and resources they need to overcome the impact of the trauma they've already experienced. I think we need to redefine what we consider a quality education. It's not enough to think of schools as simply transmitting information. I think schools need to prepare the minds of the students to absorb that knowledge. 
Because it doesn't matter how fantastic your curriculum is if you're trying to teach students whose brains are insulated by the effects of trauma. We should all care about this because we're all stakeholders in the education system. We're taxpayers who fund it. We're current or future employers who will hire the people who graduate from it. And many of us are current or future parents who are going to send our kids into it. Now, if we, as the stakeholders, exist in a society that is full of people who are robbed of their education, we shouldn't be okay with that. Now I realize that there's been a lot of doom and gloom so far. And I'm not a doom and gloom kind of guy. I have a lot of great things to share about three schools across this country that are doing meaningful things to address the impact of trauma. The first one is a high school in Washington State. They've taken an institutional approach. They've put aside the resources to train teachers to recognize and deal with the impact of trauma among their students and hired mental health professionals on site. What this looks like is when a student like Sean is acting out in class, his teacher doesn't ask herself initially, what's wrong with Sean? But what happened to him? And with that as the beginning of the conversation, Sean can start a journey of recovery, starting in the classroom and culminating in the office of that mental health professional on campus helping him get through what he's experienced. Another great example is the elementary school in Texas called the Momentus Institute. They've addressed one particular symptom of childhood trauma, which is the inability to regulate your emotions. The way they've done that is they've turned to a trusty glitter ball. They've given every single student a plastic ball filled with water and glitter, and it holds the key to teaching students like Sean how to overcome his lack of emotional regulation. Because when he gets upset or angry, he's trained to first shake up that glitter ball and not respond to his emotion. As the glitter, glitter swirls around inside the ball, Sean thinks about what he's feeling and what the most productive way to respond to that is. Once that glitter has settled, so has he. And over the course of years, he learns how to overcome the emotions he's experiencing. And every day that might have been lost to emotions that are out of control, are reclaimed by Sean. The final example is being developed right here at Stanford GSB. It's called Mindful K-12, and it's an app that allows a high school teacher to start a day with a mindfulness exercise. Now, in addition to all of the wonderful benefits of mindfulness, this activity, done on the phones of students, culminates in one question. What emotion do you feel most this morning? The result? is a roster for the teacher, every student and every emotion. So that when Sean has his head on his desk in the back of the classroom, his teacher knows that he reported feeling really sad this morning. And instead of telling him to shape up, she can walk beside him, ask what happened, and reclaim one more day of Sean's education. Our education system may have a cancer, but it's not a death sentence. There are meaningful things that schools across this country are doing to help students like Sean overcome the impact of their trauma. If we, as the stakeholders in the education system, can help these schools set aside the resources necessary to value their students' mental health as much as their test scores, then we could see some dramatic improvement. If all of us, as the stakeholders, can redefine how we consider quality education, then maybe we, can help give Sean's and people like him all around this country their education back. Thank you.